ओम भद्रम करने भी श्रृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्ये माक्ष स्थिरंग सुष्टुवागुम सस्तनु व्यषेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नस्ताक्ष्यो अरिष्ट स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओं शाति 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 Om, O gods, may we hear auspicious words with our ears. While engaged in sacrifices, may we see auspicious things with the eyes. While praising the gods with steady limbs, may we enjoy a life that is beneficial to the gods. May Indra of ancient fame be auspicious to us. May the all-knowing Pusha, god of the earth, be propitious to us. May Garuda, the destroyer of evil, be well disposed towards us. May Brihaspati ensure our welfare. Om, peace, peace, peace. So that was the peace chant. And we are studying the Mundaka Upanishad. In the Mundaka Upanishad, we saw how the student Shonaka went to the teacher Angiras and asked this amazing question. What is that, sir, by knowing which everything can be known? So he's asking about Brahma Vidya, the, the knowledge of the ultimate reality, that reality which appears to us as the entire world. So if you know that, you will know everything. Everything in the sense that everything is Brahman, in that sense. Now, uh, the teacher said knowledge is of two kinds, the lower knowledge and the higher knowledge, the supreme knowledge and the relative knowledge. And uh, he said the relative knowledge, the lower knowledge is everything all the Vedas and whatever we know, whatever we call today secular, whatever we call religious, all of that is the lower knowledge. And the higher knowledge is that by which you realize the imperishable. Aksharam tad adhigamyate. Parayaya tad aksharam adhigamyate. The higher knowledge, the supreme knowledge is that by which the akshara, the imperishable is known. Imperishable means the ultimate spiritual reality. Um, then he went on to talk about the ultimate reality. And in the next section, which we are doing now, the teacher goes back to discussing the lower knowledge. There's a short discussion about the lower knowledge. Um, the lower knowledge, para aparavidya, it encompasses everything that we study and know. However, in this context, which context is this? This is the Vedic context. In the Vedic context, the lower knowledge means the karma kanda. The Vedas we know are structured in this way. There is the bulk of the Vedas deal with rituals, with karma. And these rituals are meant for uh, fulfilling our desires in this world and in the next world. In this world, whatever we want, by performing these rituals, the gods will bless us with fulfillment, uh, with, a, with a healthy body, with uh, um, prosperity, with... Uh, you know, rainfall and plenty of cows and plenty of wealth and plenty of children and grandchildren and all of that, whatever one could want in this world, defeating your enemies, etc., etc. And then in the other world, after death, you go to heaven. And there, are, there are multiple heavens, depending upon the punya, the merit you have accumulated, the good karma you have accumulated by doing all these Vedic rituals, you can attain to a variety of heavens, all of which are temporary, strictly temporary. They last for a long time, but they come to an end. And thus goes on this cycle of birth and death. Now, these uh, karmas, which represent the lower knowledge, having mentioned those karmas, now the teacher, the Upanishad, is criticizing them. He's saying that those, um, those karmas are strictly limited to expect that you will attain fulfillment by fulfilling desires in this life or in heaven is a vain hope. It is like trying to cross the ocean of samsara in a frail raft. Plava yete adrida yajna rupa. The Upanishad said, these yajnas, these fire sacrifices taught in the Vedas, they are frail, they are weak, they are not capable of taking you beyond sorrow. So those who rely on this ritualistic religion, they are foolish because uh, the, the, these karmas will not give you lasting fulfillment. 
they will not they are all still well within the world of maya well within the world of limitations although they are religious they are pious they are better than leading um, an evil life or an immoral life they are these the vedic lifestyle the ritualistic vedic lifestyle is uh, a pure lifestyle uh, um, something that is good for you good for society but still does not lead to the ultimate reality it still is not what you asked for knowing which everything is known if you know the vedic rituals um, and if you do them there are certain benefits you will get but they're strictly limited so if you know the lower knowledge you will know you will get some benefits whether it's religion or science but strictly limited you will not attain fulfillment and then he criticizes that and remember when he criticizes the vedic karma kanda is a delicate balancing act he does not mean to condemn the karma kanda because in most cases if you condemn that you are condemning the kind of religion and ethics that most good people in the world follow and if you do that the result generally will be for them to sink back into a lower level of uh, immorality uh, of uh, of a dissolute life so what he is saying is is something higher than this something greater than this this is good there was a book the title of the book was good is the enemy of the great good is the enemy of the great so if you're good and many people say i am a good person i am leading a good life what else do i need to do um, so to so the criticism here is there is something higher because you ask the question what is that by knowing which everything is known another form of the question is what is that by which i can transcend this circle of birth and death how how i can lead uh, reach the limitless if that is your question then this kind of vedic ritualism is not the answer it's not sufficient we have done up to verse number 9 and in verse number 10 he concludes the criticism of uh, vedic ritualism the topic of vedic ritualism is still not yet complete but 10th verse we'll look at 10th verse first ishtapurtam manyamana varishtam nanyat shreyo vedayante pramudha na kasya prishthe te sukrite na anubhutva imam lokam heenataram va vishanti the deluded fools believing the rites inculcated by the vedas and the smritis to be the highest do not understand that other thing that leads to liberation they have enjoyed the fruits of actions they having enjoyed the fruits of actions in the abode of pleasure on the heights of heaven enter this world or an inferior one ishtapurtam so this is he refers to the various prescriptions in the ritualistic portion of the vedas ishta and purta these are two kinds of commandments in the vedas that do these things these are recommendations um ishta are the uh, vedic uh, rituals yaga yaga adi kam shankara acharya says the vedic rituals which are taught in the vedas that means in our uh, and the purta would be the works of welfare uh, you know he gives the example of if you have a well dug or if you um you know have a pond made for the pe- people of the locality or you establish a school or uh, a guest house for travelers pilgrims things like that for the welfare of society in general so that is called purta karma these are two kinds of karma or action which you find uh, taught in the scriptures um basically we might say religious piety actions of religious piety like performing pujas or going to church regularly and works of social welfare and see who does who do this good people do these things people we consider to be moral good upstanding people in society they do these things and the upanishad says pramudas deluded fools remember it's not a criticism see the principle here is it's not a criticism of people who are moral and religious not at all in fact they are to be praised that's a much better state than being immoral and dissolute and destructive however uh the principle here here is this is criticized in order to praise something higher um so criticism is not meant here nahi nindya ninditum 
nindyam ninditum pravartate <laughs> there is a formula that in the vedas any criticism is not there to criticize the criticized object rather it is to praise something else in order to show the superiority of something else because what is being criticized here is the vedas themselves they are good but what is being praised here is brahma vidya the spiritual science the higher um, higher religion spirituality so um i have often mentioned this you can this religion has these two aspects one you can call the conventional religion the second you can call spirituality or the higher religion what's the difference conventional religion so the goal of all of them is the same which which we all have and even people who are not religious and immoral people all of us we are basically have, we are pursuing the same goal the goal is happiness fulfillment the goal is overcoming unhappiness misery so that's what all living beings are pursuing regardless humans uh, animals all now those who do so without any regard to morality duty um, religion they fall to an instinctive animalistic level so they do evil things immoral things or they lead lives of irresponsibility and cause harm to themselves and cause harm to others to rise above that there is religion religion said look you can have what you want you want pleasure in this world karma you want success and prosperity in this world artha all of that you can have but do it within the limits of dharma do it within within the bounds of morality and then you can have a wonderful life yourself sustainably good life here and good for society good for family society community all of that so this is religion this is called conventional religion and that's there in every religion in fact that that is one of the cornerstones of civilization any civilization to rise above a very primitive level must have this standard of morality there yeah. honesty self control the sanctity of uh, you know contracts that you enter into whether it is economic or marriage or whatever it is so all of these they hold a society together and they make civilization possible and they make a good human life possible uh, that is conventional religion so religion for improving my life for making this life better for helping me to get what i want in this world and extend it further into the other world after death we continue to exist so can we go to heaven after death can can we have an experience after death which is uh, which is all pleasure which is all good without all the problems which we have in this world there is the concept of heaven a pleasurable place and they hindus buddhist jains we believed in multiple heavens multiple uh, kinds of such heavenly worlds so all of this falls under karma kanda all of this falls under conventional religion or in the language of this upanishad all of this falls under lower knowledge apara vidya lower knowledge and uh, these two ishta are the worship the, the rituals prescribed in the vedas Uh, the fire sacrifices and purta are the works of social welfare ishta purta the word ishta it might be confusing to some because many of us are initiated practices practitioners and we have been given ishta devata the form of the deity which is our chosen deity so the word ishta has two meanings first of all the word ishta commonly in sanskrit is what we like whatever we want is ishta whatever we consider desirable anything whether religious or secular so that's ishta desired liked wanted um and in the vedic context it means ritualistic worship specifically the fire rituals prescribed in the vedas those who are initiated here the word ishta means both what you like or want and also the worship that you do so ishta devata the worshiped deity and the desired deity the same the word means both for us um manyamana varishtam those few people why are they foolish because they think this is the highest this is the best life possible the noblest greatest life our religion teaches us this and we are following this uh, we will be happy in this world we'll build a good family society and in the next world we'll go and stay in heaven and what could be greater than this varishtam this is the best nanyat shreyo 
they do not know that there is something higher than this what is higher shreya means so in in the upanishads the two words shreya and preya preya means pleasurable nice pleasant shreya means that which is ultimately beneficial so what is the difference between the two both of them are concerned with human happiness but that which instantly right now is pleasurable seems nice to us nice food and nice company and wealth and power and appreciation that's preya pleasurable shreya is ethics and spirituality and ultimately moksha nirvana god realization that is shreya uh, moksha especially they don't know this or they don't they are not willing to recognize that there is something higher than this the higher knowledge para vidya what does it give us shreya the um highest attainment moksha nirvana enlightenment freedom from the cycle of birth and death see this lower knowledge the ritualistic religion the conventional religion keeps us in the cycle of birth and death it still keeps us in samsara good samsara a good samsara but keeps us in samsara a good samsara also he will show is also a dangerous samsara because in any samsara good or bad you cannot avoid um death you cannot avoid impermanence you cannot avoid sorrow even in a good samsara there will be sorrow there will be unhappiness you will get happiness which will go away and unhappiness will come again what do they do by by all this um, rituals nanya nakasya prishthete sukrite na anubhutva very poetic um they go to the highest heavens naka naka means uh, heaven prishta is the hi- highest levels of heaven they attain to the highest levels of heaven how sukritena sukrita means the accumulated good karma having performed rituals throughout their lives having done ishta and purta ritualistic action and uh, you know action for social good doing good to others they have accumulated lot of good karma so they are punya karma lot of good a um, lot of merit is there good karma is there because of which they go to high heavens after death so when you when i say high heavens in vedanta on hinduism for example they talk about um seven heavens in english also seventh heaven there's a term the seven heavens seven layers of heaven are there heaven means of course that includes this world also and then six higher ones why is all this wrong what's really wrong with it anubhutva having enjoyed for many many years what happens imam lokam they're back again to square one back to this world or more terrible hinataram va bishanti they fall to lower worlds lower worlds means they may even get an animal birth often in vedanta we talk about we think that having uh, uh, attained human birth and a good human birth where you are performing all these rituals and you're a good person there's no way you can go back to an animal birth but here is the upanishad itself saying they can fall straight from heaven into an animal birth hinataram va vishanti why would that be because um going to heaven you have cashed in all your credit now only the debits remain all the <laughs> problems remain Um, bad karma in the past and they become powerful and they drag down the sentient being to terrible experiences like an um, animal experience for example so imam lokam hinataram va vishanti they fall back into this world or to lower worlds lower worlds means lower births you know, animal births so that concludes the um criticism of vedic ritualism or the lower knowledge in order to do what not to criticize in order to praise the higher knowledge in order to show there is something greater that the spirituality is greater than uh, conventional religion conventional religion is always for using religion to improve this life uh, or my heavenly life but spirituality is to uh, to use this life to attain the goal which spirituality sets for us that god realization or enlightenment a brahma gyana now 11th verse 11th mantra is see the karma kanda the ritualistic portion of the vedas actually has two parts in it 
See, the Vedas itself, two parts. The ritualistic portion and the knowledge portion. Karma Kanda, Jnana Kanda. And when we are doing Upanishads, we are firmly in the Jnana Kanda, knowledge portion. The spiritual philosophical portion. But the rich, preceding portion, the ritualistic portion, the Veda Purva Bhaga, the, the uh, uh, earlier portion of the Vedas, that actually has two parts. One is Karma, the other one is Upasana. In, um, if you translate, ritualistic action and meditation. So, both are action. One is physical action, one is mental action. Now, what is this? In the physical action also, where they perform rituals, there is, of course, the mind is involved. You have to remember the mantras and you have to, you know, mind has to be active. But the emphasis is on actually performing rituals. Uh, if you see a puja, you will understand. Uh, that is the modern equivalent of those ancient fire sacrifices. So in a puja, you will see the worshipper, the pujari, uh, who offers flowers, who is pouring water and chanting mantras with the, with the tongue. So words, language is used, actual action is there. These uh, mudras, various hand formations and symbols are shown to the deity and so many things, so many actions. And those who help in the puja, someone makes a garland, someone collects fruits and flowers, someone cleans the shrine, and so on. Someone decorates the uh, image or the photograph or whatever it is. So all of these are physical actions. That is karma. Now, if you watch the puja carefully, at times the pujari sits still. Now, he's not actually still. Because physically he's not doing anything, he's not speaking anything uh, verbally also. But mentally, you will be repeating a mantra and visualizing certain things. The visualizing the deity or certain offerings. Now, that is called upasana. Or in Vedic terms, there are terms like vidya. Vidya, you know, vidya, the word is, we are using it for knowledge. But there in the karma kanda of the Vedas, the word vidya meant particular Vedic meditations. Specific Vedic meditations. Those have fallen into disuse now. But they have been replaced by upasana or meditations on the deity. So those who are worshipping Shiva, they will at, at, and perform all the rituals. But at one point, they will stop for a while and visualize Shiva in the lotus of their heart and perform a mental puja. Uh, so that is upasana. The word upasana literally means sitting next to God, um, being in the presence of God. Asana to sit, upa near. So sitting next to God, being in the presence of God. So these were rituals and physical action, mental action. So far, what he had been talking about was physical action. Now, one last uh, mantra about the uh, karma. This will be about mental action, the meditations. So one eleventh mantra will be, it's still about karma, still about the lower knowledge, uh, still about ritualistic action, but not about the physical action. Now it's about the mental action. I'll give you an example from my personal experience. So, um, every day in the morning in our monastery at Belurmat, the main monastery in India on the bank of the Ganga, um, after breakfast or sometimes before breakfast actually, I would go to all the temples and bow down there. So, I had a particular route which I would take. Temple of Sri Ramakrishna and then circumambulate it and go to Temple of Swami Brahmananda, Ma Sharada's temple, Swami Vivekananda's temple. And then there is a Samadhi Ghat where um, the cremation of the monks is done, the direct disciples' bodies were cremated and the Ganga itself and salute the sun which is rising on the eastern horizon and so on. So I had a um, particular track and I did this for more than 10 years, um, every day. Now, here I cannot do it. I am far, far away from Belurmat. So, but what I can do is, I can sit quietly and bring it all before my mind's eye. And because I've done it year after year after year, I can visualize every step of the way. I can, I can feel the cool stones beneath my feet as I climb up to the temple. I can, you know, Every step I can visualize very clearly. The Garbhagriya, the inner shrine, the image of Sri Ramakrishna, the uh, worship going on. All of this, it's very, it's like multi multimedia, <laughs> like, you know, in my mind, it's, it's very, 
I can see it. I can almost smell the incense. I can almost tactile feel the cool marble of the temple and so on. And then from the temple, my walk down the bank of the Ganga to each each separate temple, all of this I can visualize very clearly. Now, what, what has happened is that physical action, that's like the karma, that is the actual physically doing something. And this same thing, when I sit quietly, and it's only going on in my mind, that is called upasana. So visualizing it uh, mentally. That's a rough example. That's not exactly what the Vedic Rishis did. They had an entirely very detailed set of physical rituals, mantras to be chanted verbally, and visualizations to be done mentally. But the, roughly, I can tell you the difference between the physical action and the mental action. Now, the 11th mantra talks about the mental action. Still within Karma Kanda, still lower knowledge. Tapashraddheye uhiopapasantyaranye Shanta vidvangso bhaikshacharyam charanta Surya dware nate viraja prayanti Yatram ritasa purusho yabhyayatma. Very um, poetic. I will translate for you. Those who live in the forest while begging for alms, that is, those forest dwellers and hermits who resort to the duties of their respective stages of life as well as to meditation, and the learned householders who have their senses under control, they, after becoming freed from uh, dirt, that is, impurities, go by the path of the sun to where lives that Purusha, immortal and undecaying by nature. Okay, that's a lot to unpack. But remember the context. Still we are in Karma Kanda, only mental Karma Kanda. Only uh, those who practice this higher kind of uh, meditation, this higher kind of karma, which is meditation. What's their goal? They still want to go to heaven. So that's still their goal. I'll read the commentary here also a little bit. Those who live in the forests. All right, a little bit here. Those who live in the forests. The original division of a Vedic life was Brahmachari, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, Sanyasi. So the Brahmachari would spend most of his life in the time as a Brahmachari, the, as a student in the ashram of some master learning the scriptures, learning the texts, learning. It would be life of study. There would be some ritual, some meditation to be performed, but not much. And then comes the life of a householder, where you get married and you hold a job and do something in society. So what is the, the religious part of it? Their rituals become predominant, the physical rituals. There are lots of rituals to be done, which are prescribed for householders, those who are married. And as long as you are in the householder stage of life, uh, you do those rituals daily and occasionally when the specific days come. This was prescribed for a pious person. who, If you consider yourself religious, you would do those things. Then comes a time when your children have grown up and gone. Um, you're in middle age or advanced years. Then the husband and wife, they retire into uh, Aranya. That means they go to the forest or the mountains or you know away from a busy city life and then their life becomes more concentrated on the meditations not the physical uh, rituals the religious part of their life becomes more important and the meditation becomes more important rather than the uh, physical rituals so instead of doing a puja you might like i say and you know sit and quietly and visualize the puja mentally not actually do it outside and such um, householders would retire from active involvement with society even if you cannot go into the forest, here in this uh, country itself, I saw the, the, the uh, concept of a retirement colony is there. I went to at least three such places in the last one or two years. And wonderful. It's mostly elderly people. They have retired and they are nice houses. It's um, almost like dwelling in the forest because it's outside a major city and it's very quiet and peaceful. Um, and the places I went to, of course, I was invited by devotees. So they're really leaving a, living a Vanaprastha life, a life devoted to study, to worship, 
and occasional retreat, invite a Swami to give a talk and so on. So this is the Vanaprastha life. This is what he's talking about. So such people, what do they do? Tapa Shraddha. Literally it means, Shraddha means uh, 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 religious faith and Tapa means austerities. But here technically there's a meaning here. Tapa and Shraddha here means um, Tapaha, Swashrama, Vihitam Karma. Doing the religious rituals, the Karma Kanda prescribed for your Ashrama. Your Ashrama means uh, are you a Brahmachari, a student, are you a Grihastha or householder or are you a Vanaprastha who's, who's retired now, a forest dweller. So forest dweller here, we are talking about forest dwellers here and they have certain prescribed uh, religious duties. Then Tapa and then Shraddha means Hiranyagarbha Adi Vishaya Vidyaha. So the, me the meditations which are prescribed. So here the Shraddha, the word Shraddha does not mean a generic faith, but actually the practice of certain meditations. They are engaged. So husband and wife, they will be engaged in um, you know, study and meditation and so on. Um, who are mentioned here? Vanaprastha, the forest dwellers and sannyasis. Oh, I didn't mention the sannyasis. So up to the forest dweller stage, so from student, householder, forest dweller stage, all of them, they are in the realm of the lower knowledge, aparavidya. The sannyasi, when you become a monk, finally, the last stage of life, you are supposed to um, dwell entirely in the knowledge portion of the Vedas. The, what we are studying now, the Upanishads, the quest for enlightenment, the quest for God-realization, the quest for liberation, moksha. So this is just a, a scheme. It's not that you have to follow this literally. Those who have this quest already, that they will come. So this is not talking about any of us. All of us who are here, our mantra will come next from the 12th mantra onwards. But this is talking about um, those who are forest dwellers, Pious people in the evening of their lives, they live the lives of piety. Shanta. Shant, shanta means peaceful. Peaceful in the sense controlled and disciplined lives. Uparata karanagrama. So their sense, senses are under control and so they're not restless. So one can be a leader, righteous, retired life also. <laughs> you know, uh, Sometimes I hear, um, especially in this country, I've heard, oh, my grandma or grandpa, they're, they're doing so well. You know, the very active uh, person uh, goes hiking and then uh, so interested, goes on cruises and uh, has this, this uh, group and that group. All right, in a certain sense, better than being sad, but it's still not good. At this time in life, when you are in your 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, one should have the maturity to stop uh, hiking and going into card games. And When will there be a time to um, pursue a spiritual life, a spiritual pursuit, God realization? Sri Ramakrishna once saw a group of elderly men sitting and playing cards and he was shocked and he said, has the time to call upon God not yet come? Has the time not yet come? So, um, Yes, these are people who have devote, devoting their the evening of their lives to um, pursuit of a, a religious goal. And ultimately, one must come to this goal of God realization, spirituality. I'm, I am a person who's seeking God. If you come to it younger, good. We'll see. They're going to talk about you next. Then he says, Vidwangs, uh, Vidwangs literally means the those of knowledge. Here, knowledge means Shankaracharya uh, comments Vidwangs or Grihasthascha Jnana Pradhana. These are householders who are elderly and uh, who have gone become forest dwellers. And Jnana Pradhana. Here, Jnana does not mean Upanishadic Jnana or the higher knowledge. Here, it means the meditations, the mental karma which is prescribed in the uh, Vedas. So they dwell, they spend their time. Now, one might ask here, you keep saying meditations prescribed in the Vedas, but what is the equivalent for us today? 
So in a general sense, one might take it, those who are devoted to God in some form, um, you know, Vishnu, Narayana, whatever, and yet they are not really seeking moksha. And they want that. So this is a, like a very interesting, very small demographic, I would say, who are religious, who are pious, but they would want to go and stay in heaven with God, and that's it. Um, in Vedic terminology, they want to go to Brahma Loka or Satya Loka, and the highest heaven, and they want to stay there. They are very pious people, very good people. How do they live? Bhaiksha Charyam Charanta. So they have given up their jobs, and uh, here in the United States, you don't have to live on arms. Here he says they live on arms. If you do that here, you'll be arrested or you'll get into trouble with the law. But uh, the traditional idea was, see, the three ashramas, the three sections of society, the students, brahmacharis, the vanaprasthis, forest dwellers, the retired persons, and monks, sannyasis, all of them, they live on arms. And who provides the arms? The one section, the householders. So the householders were the foundation of uh, this uh, traditional idea of society in India. They are the, the devout householders. On them depended the brahmacharis. On them depended the retired folk. On them depended the monks. Because they all lived on arms. And then what else does he say? Such people. Viraja. They are freed of impurities. They lead, lead very pure, devout lives. And what happens after death? They go to their desired heaven. The Vaishnava will find uh, himself or herself landing up in uh, Vaikuntha, the abode of Vishnu, or Goloka, the abode of Krishna. And uh, Shaivite will find himself uh, in uh, uh, Shivaloka, Kailasha, or the worshipper of the mother will find, say, I am in Devi Loka, the, uh, the sphere of the Divine Mother, or the Christian heaven, or the Jewish or Islamic heaven, or even the Buddhists who do not do not worship God, but they have a conception of heavens. There's multiple pure land heavens. So you will find yourself there. How is that different from spirituality? How is that different from enlightenment? So he raises this question here, Shankaracharya, in his commentary. No, no, etam moksha michanti kechit. So this is moksha. Some would say that then what is being described here so poetically, they go um, completely purified, viraja, beyond impurity, beyond all desire. Prayanti, after death, they go by the way of the sun, Surya Dwarena. Way of the sun is a, a very symbolic way of indicating what is known as uh, the, the um, what is called Shuklagati, the bright um, path, the bright path. So the soul, this, the sentient being after the physical death travels through various exp exp uh, experiences after death and reaches heaven. And this path is called the bright path, Shuklagati, compared to others, which is Krishnagati, the dark path, who will come back to this world much sooner. But going to the higher heavens is the bright path, also known as uh, Uttarayana. The northern path. Uh, here he says, Surya Dwarena, by the door of the sun. This is also a clue to see that this is not enlightenment or freedom. Going and coming means that there is, uh, enlightenment has not been achieved yet. Uh, prayanti, leave this body at death. If you leave this body at death, you still have an individuality. This individual sentient being is going somewhere, no matter how high and pure. Now, what happens there when you reach your destination? Yatramrita sa purusho yavyayatma. The immortal, the world of, of immortality, where lives God, or here specifically it means Hiranyagarbha. Consciousness limited by the cosmic mind. Hiranyagarbha. Another name is Brahma. Um, in more general terms, you might say you go to heaven in the presence of God. Even Ishwara, you can say, though it has not been mentioned that, that way. Yavdhyayatma, beyond any decay. But didn't you say the ultimate reality is beyond the decay? Um, the ak Akshara. What's the difference? Shankaracharya explains here. Avdhyayatma, avdhyaya swabhava yavat samsara sthai. So, 
this heaven which you will reach, the highest heaven, Satya Loka, Brahma Loka, in the presence of Brahma or Hiranyagarbha and live there for countless years, for millennia and millennia altogether. So is it in, truly immortal? No, it's not truly immortal. Yavat samsarasthai, as long as this universe exists, till the end of the universe, till the end of time, until the end of time, space, till the end of this universe, you will exist in the presence of Hiranyagarbha. And that is a very exalted state. But what will happen after that? It will all come to an end. When this creation, this cycle of creation comes to an end, Mahapralaya, the entire universe is dissolved, including the highest heavens. They are all dismantled. <laughs> so, or what have, uh, exists after that? Ishwara, God alone with, with Maya exists. And in Maya are embedded the those jivas, sentient beings who have not yet attained enlightenment. They, they live in their causal body as part of Maya. Sri Ramakrishna put this very simply. He said, at the end of a harvest season, the granny in the house, she goes out to the field and collects the seeds of different plants and puts them in little cloth, um, I mean, in the village where he grew up, they actually used to do that. They would put them in little cloth packets. And the next time when the sowing season comes, she knows which one to plant at which time. So what are those seeds which the granny collects? Who is granny? Mahamaya, the Divine Mother. She collects us, those who have not yet attained enlightenment. And where will she collect us from? Across the universe, across the heavens, across this world, across hells, whatever we are, whichever state we are. Highly evolved souls staying in heaven or in Brahma Loka or the less evolved ones staying in various uh, heavens or in this world or the even the evil ones who are staying in hells and so on and so forth. They're all collected and they're kept. When the next universe will be created, you're back to square one. I mean, not square one exactly. You continue your spiritual evolution. So you will be given another chance at becoming enlightened. Now, one escape door is here. If you attain to this Brahma Loka, this is um, Vedanta 101, they, this is something that all the Upanishads agree on. If you attain to this Brahma Loka, there one can become enlightened. One can realize, I am Brahman. You realize Brahman. The higher knowledge is available very easily there. Upanishad says, where can we get enlightenment? The human birth. That's why the human birth is exalted so much. If you try, you will get enlightenment in the human birth and be free of this samsara. Or... In Brahma Loka, this highest heaven which they are talking about, there also one can attain enlightenment. And if you do that, then you'll be free. You don't, Granny won't collect you anymore. You will attain freedom and uh, realize you are Brahman, you will be free of the cycle of birth and death. And the higher knowledge, you will be in the realm of the higher knowledge. Until then, so who will attain that freedom? Those who have gone to that highest heaven have no more desires. They want to remain in the presence of God and attain to the final liberation at the end of the universe. They will. This is called Krama Mukti, sequential liberation. From here to highest heaven to final liberation. It's a long, long term project. Millions and millions of years. And this is all. You might say all of this is you're just believing these things. True, you're just believing. If you don't want this path, then the higher knowledge. You want to realize this here and now. Now, you want to see for yourself. That's coming. That's coming next. All of this, not for us. So, But is it open to us? Yes. If we do not attain to the final liberation in this life, and if you do your japa and dhyana, if you are meditative, devout, prayerful, then you will attain to Brahma Loka, your desired heaven. We as devotees of Sri Ramakrishna, we believe in Ramakrishna Loka. These are all different aspects of Brahma Loka. One sadhu said, this Brahma Loka, this highest heaven, you take a photograph from one side, it will look like the Christian heaven. From the other side, if you look at it, you take a photograph, you will get a photograph of Vaikuntha, the heaven of the Vaishnavas. From another side, um, you will get Kailasha, the heaven of the Shaivite. But basically, it is that same, it is that highest, um, highest possibility in the realm of karma. The highest possibility in the realm of karma. In fact, that's the phrase Shankaracharya uses. Yeah. So why isn't this moksha? Shankaracharya says, Apara vidya prakarane hi pravritte. Remember, this is the uh, part of the text dealing with lower knowledge. Apara vidya. Suddenly it will not refer to moksha. This section dealing with the higher knowledge will talk about moksha and that's coming. It's not yet come there. 
Then you said, but you're purified of all desires. But purified of all desires is only those who are going to be liberated. He says, virajastvam tu apekshikam. Apekshikam, he says. That also is relative. You're purified of all worldly desires, but one might have the desire to live in heaven endlessly and enjoy heaven. So this is also a relative purity. Now, we are coming to entirely different. Change of scene, change of sequence, big difference. From conventional religion to spirituality. From karma kanda to jnana kanda. From aparavidya, lower knowledge, to paravidya, the transcendent or supreme knowledge. From going and coming to heaven and earth and hell to, um, uh, to re release from going and coming. From a good samsara to no samsara, freedom from samsara. That is coming now. Number 12. Pariksha lokan karma chitan brahmano nirveda mayat nastya krita kritena tad vigyanartham sa guru meva bhigachet samit pani shrotriyam brahmanishtam. Let me read the translation. This is a transitional mantra, very important, often quoted to show the beginning of spirit, true spirituality. This is what this is talking about us finally. What was going on earlier was not about us. We here who are here are spiritual seekers. At least most of us, we are spiritual seekers. And this is talking about us. Number 12. A Brahmana should resort to renunciation after examining the worlds acquired through karma. With the help of this maxim, there is nothing here that is not the result of karma. So what is the need of performing karma? For knowing that reality, he should go with sacrif sacrificial wood in hand only to a teacher versed in Vedas and absorbed in Brahman. Okay, a lot to unpack here. So he says here, Brahmano. So Brahm here Brahm Brahm Brahmana does not mean the caste Brahmin. Here it means a spiritual seeker. One who is renouncing worldly goals and pursuing um, spiritual goals. You see, that sounds like a monk. Yes, that's why a person becomes a sannyasi or a monk to pursue spiritual goals. However, in the household life also, remember there were many, many people who were householders and also fully enlightened. So in the household life also, if one makes enlightenment a goal, who am I? What is my purpose in life? Right now, what is my project in life? To attain God-realization, moksha. Uh, in Hindi they say, um, choti mu badi baat. I am a very small person to say claim such a thing that I am seeking moksha. No, you are not. Um, Vedanta, uh, Hinduism gives these four goals for all human beings. All human beings. Dharma, kama, moksha. Kama, the pursuit of pleasure. Moksha, um, dha, um, artha, the pursuit of prosperity and success. Dharma, morality. Um, and then moksha, spiritual liberation and freedom. So these are what we pursue. As long as you are pursuing dharma thakama, that is the lower knowledge, aparavidya. When you are pursuing moksha, that is the higher knowledge. If you are like Krishna, like Arjuna, in the house, they were all householders. The Bhagavad Gita, the, one of the major texts of Vedanta, is taught by a householder to another householder. So you will still go on do it, doing what is what needs to be done. Uh, but that is no longer your goal. Notice the classic case of the Bhagavad Gita. When Arjuna comes into the Bhagavad Gita, to the, to the battlefield in Mahabharata, the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, what does Arjuna want? To do his duty, to defeat the evil people, to get, get what is rightfully his, to uh, avenge the wrongs done to the Pandavas and to Draupadi and so on and so forth. All of which are laudable moral goals, ethical goals, duty, duty of a noble Kshatriya, warrior, what they are supposed to do in life. And in our scheme, lower knowledge or higher knowledge? Lower knowledge. Aparavidya. But then he sees the limitation. It will come here. Pariksha Lokan. Examining this world. Arjuna, it is the limitations of this lower knowledge. The conventional religion. This worldly and otherworldly life. This is brought to him with great force in the battlefield of Kurukshetra. So this isn't worth it. There is, it's really pointless. Isn't there anything higher? So Arjuna makes the transition from Aparavidya to Paravidya. 
Krishna teaches him Paravidya when when he has complete dispassion for these worldly goals. He says it isn't worth it to killing people to attain a kingdom. What's the point of it? Then Krishna teaches him the higher knowledge, that by which moksha is attained. The journey from the pleasant to the beneficial, from preya to shreya, from dharmartha kama to moksha, from aparavidya to paravidya. Gita, first chapter of Gita, that's the transition. And we also can do that. Remember, after the important point is, after transition also, Arjuna and Krishna both remained where they were. Arjuna had immediately had that question that, all right, so I should give all this up and become a monk. And Krishna told him, no, if you want to attain that higher knowledge also, then also you have to do this, this exact same thing. But the whole technology, the philosophy behind it will change. Karma will become karma yoga now for you. So Brahmana is the person who is seeking moksha. In that sense, those who are willing to renounce lower goals and make the goal of their life God-realization. Brahma Jnana, Moksha. We are all Brahmanas then. Um, what does this person do? Parikshya Lokan Karma Chitan. He says, he examines, he evaluates what the world, life. That's what Arjuna did in the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And what the result was depression. That this just isn't worth it. This is sensitive people often, when they begin to realize what life is like, you see, so many, so, so many people commit suicide. So many become, people become depressed and unhappy because they actually see through to some truth. Only thing is that there is something higher, something beyond this. I remember reading, um, uh, what's his name? Religions of the World, Houston Smith, writing when he's talking about Hinduism. When you examine whatever can be got in life, dharma, thakama, uh, after having listened to Beethoven and Mozart, he says, you still are left with this sneaking little question at the back of your mind. Is that all? That's it. That's all in life. There's nothing more than now only old age and death. Finished. Is that all? Then the Upanishads come and say, no, there is something more, something far higher. And for the first time, you will truly find what you are seeking for. What you were seeking in this world, and what conventional religion taught you to attain in a fulfilling, stable, um, honorable, um, moral way through conventional religion, aparavidya, karmakanda, now you will really get that, that fulfillment, transcendence of suffering through paravidya. So far you tried it, did not succeed, now you have realized that the infinite alone can fulfill you and the infinite cannot be attained through finite means. What will be the result of this investigation? Nastya akrita akritena. Akrita, that which is not produced by karma. What is not produced by karma? Moksha. What is not a product of karma? Brahman, the ultimate reality. It cannot be attained through kritena by karma. Karma is causality. Causality is always limited. You put in so much in the cause, the effect will be equal. As much merit you earn through rituals, that much heaven you will enjoy. But that will also come to an end. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Srine punye matya lokam vishanti. Once your stock of good karma is exhausted, even from the highest heavens, you will tumble back to this world. Or as the Upanishad just said, said even to lower births. When the good karma is exhausted, you will come back again. He says, kritena, by karma, by causality, no matter how much good karma you do, you cannot get infinite results. By Everything will be finite. Your work, your rituals, your meditations, your morality, no matter how good and great, still will be finite. The infinite cannot be attained. I was reading some of Christian theology. They had the same idea in more, uh, in different terms. So salvation, according to Catholic uh, theology, salvation is not attained by your good works. It is only attained by the grace of God. So you will become a good person and you will attain to heaven and live uh, with God forever. You will be free. Uh, but that salvation you will attain only through the grace of God, not by your own efforts. Not that you do not have to do your own. You have to put forth maximum effort. But that effort is not the, will not give the result of salvation. Similarly, moksha, 
will not be earned by your karma. Even good Vedic karma also will not give you moksha. Um, the infinite. So, Chandogya Upanishad says, Yo vai bhuma tat sukham, nal pe sukham asti. That which is the infinite, the vast, that alone is happiness. There is no happiness in the limited. This, when you realize, you have completed examination of the world. Parikshya lokan. Having examined these words, what are these words? Karma chitan. Very beautiful verse. Every word is deeply loaded with not only philosophy, with the uh, with very poignant truths about life. Not just this life, many, many lives, what we have been struggling to do. Karma Chitan, what you have earned through lifetimes of effort are all strictly limited and will always continuously flowing out of your hands. You cannot hold on to any of it. You cannot hold on to any person. You cannot hold on to any you know, wealth, any knowledge you have gained, any status you have gained. We cannot even hold on to the most dear of our things which we hold on so much to, our bodies. Everything is flowing away, continuously flowing away. This is the meaning of samsara, samsarati, always slipping out of our hands. Karma chitan, that which is born of karma, you must evaluate it. Pariksha lokan. And you will realize, none of it is infinite. And only infinite can give me happiness. For you are infinite. What else can satisfy you? These finite things can never satisfy you. Um, what does karma do? Shankaracharya in his commentary, he says, karyam utpadyam apyam samskaryam. Uh, he says, karma uh, utpadyam uh, apyam samskaryam vikarya. Karma can only do four things. One is utpadya, it can produce. So a farmer will produce the, um, you know, something in, in the fields. That's production. But you can't produce Brahman. You can't even produce moksha. If moksha were produced, it will come to an end. Something that is made will be unmade. Something that starts will come to an end. Moksha is actually eternal. We are already, we already have moksha, but we don't realize it according to Advaita Vedanta. Then the next thing you can do by karma is apyam, to attain. So there are fruits in the tree and you have to make an effort to pluck the fruits or Gramadesha, that means another village, a neighboring village. You have to make an effort to walk to that neighboring village, to walk over there, Apya, to attain it, make some effort. By no effort can you attain the uh, infinite because Brahman is all pervasive, it's already there. What effort will you make? Every effort that you make is born of ignorance and takes you further away from, from that reality. The next one is samskarya, means uh, refinement or repair or purification. Say the house needs a coat of paint. So you paint the house. That's called samskara. You cannot give a coat of paint to this life and make it uh, an enlightened life. You cannot. You It requires a dramatic change from the lower knowledge to the higher knowledge. You cannot add one more coat of paint um, you know, and say that now I'm enlightened. You cannot improve this life to make it an enlightened life. You can improve it by good karma and go up to heaven. Again, you'll have to come back. Vikarya, modification. Change this into something else. The example is given, you change milk into yogurt. So can we change our this life into uh, moksha? You cannot. Is, isn't that what enlightened people do? No. They realize that, that moksha which is always underlying, Brahman which is always underlying, which is always there in the background, that I am that and that knowledge. So the it's not through change. It's not through production. It's not through refinement or improvement. It's not through attainment. These are the things that karma can do. Since none of these can give you Brahman, what can give you Brahman? Knowledge. What is that, that knowledge? The higher knowledge. Paravidya. So now, how do you get that knowledge? We will take this up again in the next class. So you have to go to a guru and what? who is a guru, who will be a disciple. These are the topics as we enter this subject of higher knowledge, uh, Paravitya. Let's look at the comments. Sri Ram uh, says, Swamiji Pranams, is there an optimum blend of Karma Kanda and Jnana Kanda? No. In fact, here uh, Shankaracharya says, you can't do both together. Uh, he says, um, in the commentary, Nahi karmino brahmanishthata sambhavati 
कर्म आत्म ज्ञान और विरोधा he says you cannot be a seeker of brahman established or centered in brahman if you are a karmakandi because karmakanda and gyanakanda there is a virodha virodha means contradiction contradiction in what sense psychological sense not actually physical in the in the external physical sense psychologically psychologically if you realize i am brahman then why would you try to go to heaven through one kind of um, ritual why would you perform a particular ritual to you know defeat your enemies you don't have enemies so all your actions will be will will be the actions of a of a sthita pragya of a jivan mukta enlightened by living and they will not do the karma kanda but they may do the karma kanda as a um, you know uh, as karma yoga rituals performed for the welfare of all others not for their own purposes so internally you can be a gyani or a karmi externally a gyani can perform a lot of karma there is no doubt about it many shankaracharya himself performed so much karma the philosophy make for total human development yes but being a gyani and you perform karma for the welfare of all beings but you can't be a mixture of uh, gyana and agyana paravidya and aparavidya you have to be either on this side or that side and we are firmly on the uh, other side we are in paravidya we are seekers of the infinite also technically until we are truly enlightened until we realize we are brahman whatever we do it is still karma we are karmis actually that's the interesting thing as long as we are identified with the body mind and who can say we are not identified with body mind therefore the importance of karma yoga comes whatever we do is still karma including all the study which we are doing is also karma the physical and mental and verbal karma only when we realize that we are this limitless existence consciousness place and karma is only an appearance until that point we are doing karma only so this should be done in the form of karma yoga as a service to the lord as uh, taking us towards the goal of enlightenment gyana 97150 says so which is the purpose of upasana chitta shuddhi yes so these karma and upasana one can do either for attaining goals in this world or to go to heaven that's one way but that is um, which will lead to samsara again or one can do the karma and the upasana in order to purify oneself i am a seeker of brahman i am a seeker of brahma gyana enlightenment and i'm doing all my karma whether it is in office at home or social welfare whatever i am doing is um, karma yoga for purification purification of the mind will make me fit for enlightenment Amira says, "I've seen how accurate Jyotish Vidya is, which proves that predestined situations are reality. In addition to leading us towards divine and leading us towards liberation, can meditation like chanting, japa, Hari Krishna, Maha Mantra change our destiny and what's already written in our life?" Yes, uh, there is no doubt about it. The Holy Mother says that prayer to God can reduce the effect of bad karma, and she says where um, one one might have lost a leg, one will get a pin prick. Your karma is so bad; one might have lost a leg. A cut off leg would be cut off. One gets only a pin prick. A little bit of suffering is there, but a lot of suffering is avoided by the grace of God. But remember, changing our destiny is not the goal of the higher knowledge. Realizing that you are Brahman, what is the destiny of Brahman? No destiny at all. Destiny is just karma. Our karma fructifies as, as our destiny. Destiny always refers to the. karma of the individual jeeva the individual sentient being um, the whole of gyana kanda is to convince you to show you that you are not an individual sentient being you are actually uh, brahman the infinite brahman and once you realize that will you stop being this person no then you will be an enlightened jeevan mukta jeevan mukta has no interest in changing his or her destiny shiva priya says can any spiritual aspirant without ever experiencing the karma kanda in the cycle of birth and death can go directly to brahma brahman through gyana kanda it may be so in one lifetime it may seem to be so there are people like many of us we may seem to go directly to spiritual life without being too interested in the conventional religion many of us here have gone through conventional religion are religious pious people so both are possible but in the big picture even if you develop a serious interest in brahma gyan in the higher knowledge it means we will always say it means in past lives you have gone through these stages 
Sangeeta says, given that one never knows when one time of death would arrive, especially in earlier times, mortality rate was higher. How did they go about defining when and what age comes evening of life? Uh, they, their definition was when the children grow up and uh, go away. But see, we are not interested in that. We are all seekers of liberation. We are seekers of Brahman. So don't wait for, we, we are not waiting for evening of life. There is a saying, Yadareva virajet, tadareva pravirajet. When one attains vairagya, dispassion for this world, that I don't want any of this, that moment itself one should renounce. So this renounce can be um, renunciation actually, physically and becoming a monk, or it could be mentally, that I switch over from the lower knowledge to the higher knowledge. Externally, I may continue to do what I am doing, but um, internally, my project is now enlightenment. And that we can do. We don't have to wait for the evening of life. Jennifer says, I noticed you'll be teaching Yoga Vashishtasar in Pittsburgh. Sanskrit text for this available anywhere? Oh, so you're ahead of all of us. <laughs> uh, no, we're trying to get the text. The text has just been printed and it's coming from India. So if it arrives in time, which I doubt, we will uh, then do this Yoga Vashishta Sara, um, Nectar of Supreme Knowledge, translated by Swami Sarvadevanji. It was out of print. So I would really love to start with this text. In case we cannot do it in Pittsburgh, we will still take it up next year. So in some retreat or the other, in some way or the other. So to answer your question, is the text for this available anywhere? The uh, English translation, Sanskrit text in English translation is available in Chennai in the Ramakrishna Mart. They have just reprinted it, the second edition, and they are shipping it to the US. And it will be available very soon in many places. Aditya says, can all these various heavens be interpreted as the same one place? Yes. Are all these separate heavens? They may be experienced separately by devotees. So a Christian devotee might end up in heaven and say, ah, so I'm in the presence, uh, in heaven, in the presence of the heavenly father. And uh, uh, the Shiva devotee will say that I am in the presence of Shiva. That's how they will interpret it because of their conditioning of their mind. But Vedanta says they are all the same place. Brahma Loka. Brahma Loka or Satya Loka. Priyanka says, does this criticism also apply to denizens of heavens like the presiding Vedic gods? Yes, yes, all of them. All of them, unless they have already attained enlightenment because some of the Upanishads say Indra and others, they attained enlightenment. In that case, they are free. Gaurav says, did you hear about Mark Zuckerberg Lex Friedman's interview in Metaverse? I heard about that. Um, I haven't seen it yet. I think it's available on YouTube probably. Somewhere it's available. The great demonstration of virtual reality. Amira says, I bless it. I'm blessed to have been introduced to Vedanta in my early 20s. Yes, it's a great, great blessing. Keen inclination towards spirituality. Immense guilt when I think about my materialistic dreams. Now, why should you feel um, guilt? In fact, it's a great thing that see and been there, done that, and seen that, and at this young age itself, you have uh, risen out of it. It's more dangerous to be conflicted. Yes, I want spirituality, but I also want to be um, a multimillionaire and uh, have thousands of Facebook likes and get uh, and be an Oscar winner and so all of that. All of that, if it happens, very good. But that's no longer your goal. Your goal is enlightenment. Your inner goal is enlightenment. I know the ultimate truth of life, already practiced Japa and have love towards Krishna. Why am I still engrossed in these petty things? Why should I overcome this desire of ambition, competition, this young age? Because it makes me feel inadequate, even though I technically know that I am poor now. No, one does not give them up. You will be in that same field as long as you want, and you will live it in a much more uh, wise way. Like Arjuna, he remained in the battlefield after the entire teaching of Bhagavad Gita from Krishna. He remained in the battlefield and he fought the battle. But it was as Karma Yoga, uh, as a part of his spiritual sadhana. So even whatever activity that you are doing, that will become uh, sadhana for you. It it's will be part of your spiritual life. Look at all these people, whether Krishna or Arjuna or, uh, um, or Shankara, Vivekananda, uh, Gandhiji. Uh, so some were monks, some were not monks. 
all of them spiritualize their life. Wherever they are, they have spiritualized it. So you, whatever you're doing, you're doing it for a higher spiritual goal, which will lead to your enlightenment and to the benefit of other people. That should be the goal. Um, Vivekananda put the goal very clearly. Atmano Mokshartham Jagat Hitayacha. For your own liberation and for the welfare of the world, welfare of humanity. What you're doing is for the welfare of the world. And what will you get out of it? You will get enlightenment and liberation. That's the highest uh, philosophy of life. Vivekananda said, you attain liberation and enlightenment right now. Or if you cannot, then what will you do? He says, let all vision cease. Or if you cannot, dream but um, truer dreams. Dream but better dreams, which are eternal love and service free. So let every vision cease. Become enlightened and be free right now. Say, but I can't. In that case, if you want to keep on dreaming, then don't dream this lower knowledge. Dream the higher knowledge. What is the higher dream? It's still a dream, but what's the higher dream? He says, uh, eternal love and service free. So, love for all and I'm doing good to others as far as I can, freely. I don't want anything in exchange. Sri Ram says, you did not mention Upasana Kanda. What's the reason? No, I mentioned that. That Karma Kanda has two parts. One is the real physical karma, another one is the mental karma. The mental karma is Upasana Kanda. Sangeeta says, Sister Nivita, hence, henceforth, no differentiation between secular and spiritual. Yes, that is the widest and deepest understanding of Vedanta. Um, wherever we are, with whomever we are, we can spiritualize that life. Because after all, if Vedanta is true, if Brahman is a reality, then whatever we are experiencing and whomever we are experiencing must be Brahman. Though we don't see it that way. Good. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu